This is Duke University. Uh, my name is Nico Hatz. I'm Assistant Professor in Mechanical Engineering and Material Science here at Duke. And I would like to show you a few things, a few results that we have achieved over the last two, three, four years on hydrogen production in a manner that I call hybrid solar and how we use that for a fuel cell system. Um, so the idea or the vision of this whole project is to use a conventional, commercially available, low temperature fuel cell and convert hydrogen, the perfect fuel for most types of fuel cells, to electricity in a small, modular, decentralized power plant. So we try to generate electricity for a single family household, for an office building, for a community and so on. Now, hydrogen is a perfect fuel. If you burn it, if you oxidize it in a fuel cell, it gives you just water as exhaust. It has a very high energy density per mass. It's clean. But as probably you all know, uh, hydrogen is very hard to store. Uh, you have to compress it. You have to liquefy it to have the volumetric density high enough to store enough energy in your system. That has safety problems, uh, cost problems, and takes a lot of energy to compress. So what we try to do is use a different fuel, like what I show you today, methanol, but we want to use any other kind of fuel, like gasoline, biodiesel, uh, methane, whatever. And we want to convert that easily storable fuel under sunlight to hydrogen whenever we have sunlight and use that hydrogen then in a fuel cell to generate electricity. So with a bit more technical detail, we do steam reforming. We take methanol, add water, and convert it to around 3 quarters hydrogen and 1 quarter CO2. This kind of reaction, steam reforming, is how today almost all hydrogen worldwide is produced. If you buy, if you use any hydrogen, which I hope we will do more in the future. This kind of reaction, typically made from methane or natural gas, is how almost all hydrogen is coming from. We do that reaction under sunlight. I will explain in a second why. Unfortunately, we produce a little bit of carbon monoxide as well. Uh, at the reaction temperature of methanol steam form, it's around 250 degrees Celsius, some methanol will decompose, and we will generate small but significant amounts of CO, carbon monoxide, which are highly toxic for low temperature fuel cells as they are for human bodies. So we have to do something called preferential oxidation to get rid of that CO, oxidize the CO, without oxidizing too much of the hydrogen, which is our precious fuel. And then that hydrogen-rich gas mixture without CO can be stored intermediately if we want to or directly used in a fuel cell. Now a couple of issues with steam reforming of methanol and any other kind of fuel reforming, which again is the way how we produce almost all our hydrogen today. It is very energy intense in the sense that it's an endothermic reaction. So we have to keep heating our reactor to make that reaction happen. Uh, we have heat losses because it is at 250 degrees Celsius or different fuels, it's even higher. Uh, we have to preheat our fuel and our water and on that way we have to evaporate it. That actually takes away a lot of, requires a lot of heat. Industry does that today by taking part of the fuel, burning that fuel to get the heat to react the other part with this steam reform reaction. And it's simple math, it will cost you around half of your fuel. So we say we waste half of our fuel because we have to burn it to heat this reaction here. So what we want to do, obviously, is do it under sunlight, generate that 250 degrees Celsius heat uh, from the sunlight. First, we generate a catalyst due to, for the sake of time, I won't go into all the detail of how we fabricate that, but uh, nanoscale catalyst fabrication is the main uh, challenge and concern in our lab. We do this by flame spray pyrolysis, so we inject precursors, liquid precursors uh, that contain metals, in our case copper, zinc, and aluminum, into this flame where they react, and we generate these copper oxide, zinc oxide, aluminum oxide nanoparticles. And by changing the composition of these precursors, we can generate any composition of our catalyst, and by changing the speed of the flame, we can change the size. So typically, we want to have something like 10, 15 nanometer in size. We can generate a very good catalyst. It's uh, similar to uh, commercial uh, catalysts sold by BASF. Uh, here, that's the, uh, the open symbols here. Uh, you can see that our catalyst, flame spray made or FSP made, has a higher conversion over time. So BASF catalyst has a bit of higher deactivation in the first few hours. So we are somewhat better. But almost more important than the methanol conversion is we produce significantly less carbon monoxide, around 1,500 ppm compared to this fluctuation between 2,000 and 3,000 ppm for the conventional catalyst. And that makes it much easier for us to clean out the CO afterwards and have a safe, non-toxic fuel at the end for the fuel cell. Um, 
<coughs> because of the flame syrup method, we can change the composition very easily. And while um, some literature claims that 48% copper oxide is the best catalyst for methanol steam forming, we saw that if you increase it to 65 weight percent, you actually get a higher conversion over the whole range of temperatures. And very important that around 250 degrees Celsius, which is kind of our target temperature, we get full conversion with this improved better catalyst. Um, now, one major issue is we want to use these nanoparticles because they have a huge surface area per volume. So they are super active catalytically. Uh, but putting these nanoparticles in as a loose packed bed into some kind of reactor tube and putting it under sunlight as we want to do it is not easy. You have to immobilize your nanoparticles. You want to make sure that they don't blow out of the system, uh, that no matter what flow rate goes through there, they stay where we want to have them. So what we do here is we make an open porous ceramic foam structure that contains these nanoparticles. So what we do is we take nanoparticles, our catalyst, add silica uh, sands, regular beach sand basically, to increase the size of the pores in this structure. We add the natulation agent and a ceramic binder. And as soon as we add water, we create a paste that's almost like toothpaste, a bit more granular, it's pretty thick and, and viscous, but it's flow, it's flowable, we can move it. And this is not Photoshop, this is a real glass tube where we put in this precursor on one side, so the whole thing was around 12 inch long. We can put this paste on one side and then simply blow it with compressed air to the position where we want to have it. In this case, actually, we blew it a couple of times back, I think twice back and forth to some degree. And you can see that there's no dirt or no contamination or no loss of nanoparticles along this uh, transfer of the plug, of the paste. And as soon as we have it where we want to have it, we simply heat it up, the water evaporates, and we create something that is almost like concrete. We break this glass tube a thousand times more easily than the, the reactor. It's very stable mechanically thermally very robust and chemically very robust. And a major question is, um, is our catalyst, our nanoparticle still open, still uh, in contact with gas or vapor that passes through, and are, is, is it still catalytically active after this salt chelation method to make this foam? You can see here these large silica sand particles, they create large pores of several tens of microns, which is extremely important. If you had only nanoparticles, the pressure drop through that pack bar would be huge, would be immense. So we have a low pressure drop, but then all these particles are covered with a very rough, very porous, nanoporous layer of these nanoparticles. And when we test it, we can see that the solid lines are for the foam compared to the dashed lines with, uh, for the pack pad of the same amount of calories. We have basically the same conversion. We have the same um, conversion of methanol under all flow rates and temperatures. So we don't lose any catalyst. We don't lose any catalytic uh, activity. The only difference that you can see is here at high flow rates, high temperatures, actually our foam is uh, reacting, is converting more methanol. That is simply due to the fact that under those relatively harsh conditions, our packed bed got destroyed over the course of the experiments. It got compressed and had void spaces in there. So literally, our foam is very robust and stays as, as it is under all conditions. <coughs> Again, almost more importantly is that we produce overall maybe 70, only 70% of the CO, 75% of the CO in the foam compared to a conventional packed bed. That is due to the fact that the foam has a better heat transfer, so we avoid hot spots, and in those hot spots, most of the carbon monoxide is created, and we can avoid that completely. Um, I, again, can't go into all detail because the time is ticking literally every second, uh, <laughs> but we do uh, carbon monoxide preferential oxidation. So we have now this hydrogen-rich gas mixture with about 1% CO. We have to get rid of that CO because it would kill our catalyst in the fuel cell very quickly. Uh, but we don't want to just burn it off with uh, vast amounts of oxygen because we would lose a lot of our hydrogen. So what we create is a gold iron oxide particle uh, catalyst that reacts CO without reacting much of the hydrogen. And um, these kind of catalysts, ion uh, titanium dioxide or ion oxide catalysts are very well known since the 80s. But we have seen that as soon as you add CO2 and water, two components that we have uh, a lot of in our gas, uh, the, pre the preferential oxidation of the gold catalyst doesn't work very well anymore. It seems like the adsorption of oxygen on the ion oxide, the transfer of oxygen to the gold surface gets blocked by the CO2 into water. And we could counteract that by creating tiny, very small ion oxide particles uh, that are actually much smaller than the active gold. 
It's a so-called inverse catalyst to our support. The ion oxide is actually smaller than the active catalyst of gold. Uh, and with that, we were able to react basically all, 99 point something percent, almost all of the CO at temperatures like 70, 80, per, uh, 80 degrees Celsius, which is the fuel cell temperature, our target temperature, even if you have vast amounts of CO2, even if you have high amounts of water, only at an overkill amount of water above 10%, we start to see a reduction in uh, CO conversion, but up to 10%, it's really good. And if you add both CO2 and water, still we can react at 70, 80 degrees Celsius, uh, easily 99.8, 99.9% of the CO, which means we only have about 10, 20 ppm CO left in our gas if we start with 1%, and that's enough to uh, not kill our fuel cell. Now the last part of this project that I wanna show you today here is kind of the most important one. Uh, we wanna generate 250 degrees Celsius temperatures to make this reaction happen, to make the steam reforming react, uh, happen so that we don't have to heat it externally in any way. The way we do that is we use a selective absorber coating. Uh, this is from a, this is called Tynox from a German company. Uh, it's a very selective coating, meaning it absorbs a lot of sunlight but then re-emits very little, therefore it gets really hot. We put a copper tube at the, on the back side of it where we can put our fluid, let our fluid flow through and heat it up and hopefully react it. We put that in a vacuum chamber. This vacuum chamber is huge for a real commercial solar collector. This will be much smaller, but we wanna be flexible in our setup. So afterwards we have something that looks like a conventional flat plate solar collector. But we use better materials, for example, the selective absorber coating. We have a better heat transfer design in our system and we use a better vacuum. And with that, we can achieve something that conventional solar collectors cannot do. We can achieve temperatures easily above 250 degrees Celsius, even under flow of water methanol going through our system. Uh, we, made, we put then one reactor of 100 milligram of the catalyst that I showed you before into the solar collector, and we can achieve under different flow rates, 250 to 260 degrees Celsius. For a higher uh, amount of catalyst, the bigger reactor, we can achieve 235 to 250 degrees Celsius, which is sufficient to react methanol. As you can see here, for lower floats, we convert all methanol. For the bigger reactor, we can still react, it, react all the methanol to around four and a half milliliter per minute flow rate per meter square uh, solar collector, so the solar collector like that. For too high flow rates, the conversion drops then. Um, and this is the main result. This is high enough in terms of fluorides, in terms of temperatures to react uh, the methanol to hydrogen. With a smaller reactor, we can achieve up to three, almost four liter of hydrogen per meter square, um, sorry, four liter per minute per meter square in radiated area. And for the larger one around uh, almost seven, six and a half to seven liter hydrogen per minute per meter square. And if you look at how much energy that is worth, or how much is that seven, six, seven liters of hydrogen worth, this is around 1,000 or almost 1,100 watts worth of hydrogen that we produce continuously per meter square. This is under so-called one sun solar irradiation. That's a reference case. That's kind of a sunny, nice uh, day, noon, which is around 1,000 watts per meter square solar irradiation. So the simple math shows you we can convert sunlight to hydrogen with an efficiency of 100% or even a bit higher. This is cheating because we add fuel, of course. Uh, it's thermodynamically not completely correct, but if you look at sunlight to hydrogen, above 100% is very good. If you add a conventional PEM fuel cell that you can buy today very easily, uh, that has 50, 60, 70% efficiency, maybe 50, 60%, you end up with 45% efficiency, sunlight to electricity by adding a fuel. And that's of course, that's as good as the best research scale uh, photovoltaic cells uh, available today. And you cannot buy them because they're way too expensive. So I think I can make the Conclusion very quick, uh, I showed you that methanol steam reforming in our catalyst is easily possible around 250 degrees Celsius. We made this ceramic foam reactor that keeps the catalyst where it should be forever basically. And our solar collector is good enough to achieve around 250 degrees Celsius, uh, which is high enough to make methanol steam reaction happen. And in the last 45 seconds, I wanna show you some future work that's important because it's funded by the Energy Initiative, by the Energy Research seed fund, uh, collaboration with Dr. Tuan Wodin from Biomedical Engineering here at Duke. Um, we try to combine the absorption of sunlight and the catalytic reaction into one structure before we had the absorption on top of this uh, collector on this blue coating and the catalyst inside. Here what we wanna do is we wanna use plasmonic structures that have the ability to very effectively 
in small spots in these crevices between two uh, hemispheres here, uh, they're able to absorb vast amounts of sunlight there uh, due to an effect called local uh, surface plasma resonance and create very high temperatures, we hope, very locally, meaning in nanoscale. If you're able to place a catalyst in there, we hope that we can generate hydrogen, in this case from water methanol or any other kind of fuel, uh, very locally without having the heat being lost and moved into the whole structure. So basically, we have a cold reactor that does not have to go to 250 degrees Celsius, but is able to make a reaction happen here that would require 250 degrees Celsius. And very preliminary results have shown that we actually are able to produce hydrogen. But that was literally done over the, fast, oh, over the past few weeks. So I hope in a couple of months I can show you more on that. Uh, thank you for your attention. So good morning, uh, and I'm pleased to be with you today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about an uh, energy seed project uh, that I've had funded through this Duke program, along with Professor Mike and Mickelson, who's an assistant professor in electrical engineering and physics here at Duke. And our project is on uh, plasmonic enhanced tunnel junctions for organic solar cells. So our work is much more in the materials realm, understanding some fundamental materials properties and how they then impact uh, device performance for solar cells. So I just want to give you an overview of what we'll be uh, pursuing in this project. So tandem solar cells. So uh, a tandem solar cell basically means that you have multiple solar cell active regions that are stacked on top of one another in series. And the reason that you do this is to try to improve the total absorption of the solar cell. And you can do that by absorbing more of the solar spectrum. So in gray, you're seeing that same sort of input sun energy, sunlight energy from, uh, that uh, can be, is available to be absorbed. Okay, but typically, if you're uh, just using silicon, you're only getting around one narrow wavelength range. If you have multiple active regions, you can absorb the entire solar spectrum, or at least come closer to doing that. And so then you can have a more efficient solar cell. So these types of tandem solar cells using inorganic materials, so semiconductor materials similar to silicon, but in this case, usually uh, three fiber compound semiconductors, uh, but also germanium, uh, they've given the highest solar cell efficiency so far, on the order of 40% or so, and if you can use them with concentrators, you can improve the performance as well. So this tandem idea is a way to improve the efficiency of solar cells, and it's been demonstrated in inorganic materials. Now, an important part of this tandem structure is the tunnel junction. The tunnel junction connects the different active regions, and it permits the current to pass from the bottom uh, cell all the way up to the top cell without losing a lot of the charge carriers that you've created from absorption of the sunlight. Okay, so this is an established path to improving solar cell performance. Uh, and what we want to investigate is how can we incorporate this into organic-based materials, so plastics, polymers, um, organic molecules. And it's a bit more challenging. So in this case, this is showing an energy band diagram. Uh, so energy is a function of position of two different organic solar cell active regions. And they're connected again by what people call a tunnel junction. But for organic materials, this is more so a recombination layer. So you have holes from one region combined with electrons from the other region uh, so that uh, you don't have buildup of charge that can uh, lower your efficiency. But the thing to notice, so this is the, a part of a famous chart from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory that shows the efficiencies that have been verified by the lab over time for different technologies. And this is looking at organic cells versus organic tandem cells. And so around 2012, you can see that they're pretty much in the same place, right? So whereas tandem cells in inorganics has given you this huge improvement in efficiency from about 20% to 40%, you're not seeing that same type of improvement with organic solar cells. So this is what we're hoping to investigate with our project. And an important part of it is the idea of these plasmonic tunnel junctions. So what Mike and works on are plasmonic effects. So when you have metals, interface with dielectric materials like an organic or a polymer, you can essentially trap light and have increased absorption of light. And so what Mike has been working on is to create these nano cavities. So having, for example, a silver nanoparticle on top of a silver thin film with this spacer layer in between that comprises a polymer and a fluorophore. So something that can absorb light and then emit light. And uh, so she's shown this type of structure and with this then, she's demonstrated a very uh, strong enhancement in fluorescence of that organic material in the spacer layer. 
So what we're hoping to be able to do is to use these types of structures where you have metal nanoparticles on either side of a polymer material with fluorophores embedded to not only enhance absorption, but also enhance fluorescence. And that fluorescence can be tuned at a particular wavelength based on the resonant wavelength of the nano cavity. So when you have these multiple stacked active regions that are absorbing a specific range of sunlight, you could enhance the absorption and fluorescence to send more light to the next solar cell layer specific to that absorption region. Uh, and so the part uh, where my group comes in is to enable the deposition of these types of structures. So with the organic tandem structures, another challenge is that you're limited by the types of materials you can combine. If you're doing small molecules, you can make multiple structures by thermal evaporation, no problem, very similar to inorganic semiconductors. But if you're using polymers, they're usually a solution, and you want to make multiple stacked layers, you put one layer down, now you put a solution of the next layer, same solubility, you essentially destroy the bottom layer. So how are you going to make multiple stacked layers? And so this is something that my group has been addressing with a deposition technique. It's called emulsion-based resonant infrared, matrix-assisted pulse laser evaporation. And it's essentially a type of pulse laser deposition where we use an infrared laser uh, to excite a target. And this target is actually a frozen emulsion. Water in the target resonantly absorbs the laser energy and evaporates, and then carries along with it the polymer or nanoparticles, nanocomposites, to make layered structures. And this is just showing a cross-sectional transmission electron microscopy image of a substrate, two different nanocomposites separated by polymer layers, showing that we maintain these uh, layered structures and all these materials have the same solubility. Uh, so uh, thank you. Good morning, my name is Chen Peng. And uh, the topic of my presentation today is about the nanostructure material for photoelectrochemical water splitting. And, uh, and we got collaborators from a uh, mechanical engineer uh, work from, and uh, also other professors, Stan, uh, Stefan. And um, currently, I'm a research scientist in Jeffrey uh, T. Glass Group. So um, what is a photoelectrochemical water splitting? It's basically is based on the uh, junction between the semiconductor and the, and the electrolyte. So when you emulse the semiconductor into electrolyte, the, the, um, the, the the depletion, the junction region will form a depletion region inside of the semiconductor. So when in the solar radiation shine on the semiconductor, the semiconductor will generate electron and hole pairs. So this electron hole pairs in the depletion region will get separated because of potential gradients. So the electron and the hole will go to the interface between different, uh, in, uh, go to the interface between the electrode and the electrolyte. So Electrons go through the interface where we'll do the reduction reaction and generate hydrogen, for example. And the hole goes onto the surface where we'll do the oxidation reaction, for example, generate oxygen or, gener or produce or oxidize organic to produce carbon dioxide. Um, but the, uh, this is a very good um, device to, to generate fuels through solar energy. So you, you do not need any uh, energy storage devices, for example, lithium ion battery, because you automatically convert the energy into a chemical bond. But there's many challenges for this device. So the efficiency of this type of device need to be dramatically improved. So the current challenge is the bulk charge separation and the surface charge separation, which has different dimensions uh, related to the light absorption uh, depths. So that nanostructure has to be used. So there's a lot of research in this field. And also the material stability of this semiconductor is a big challenge. When you emulse any, any materials into a very close uh, electrolyte, those materials stability within 10 years is always a big question mark. Currently, there's no good material can, can stay for such a long time. And the sluggish chemical reaction kinetics for oxidation, also for hydrogen evolution, is also big challenges. So we need a good catalyst uh, which can um, drive this reaction more efficiently. So in the following, I'm going to talk about what we have done in the, in the past and what we proposed for the seed fund. So what we have done is to use, to, nano, to, to, to fabricate this transparent antimony doped tin oxide particle supported titanium oxide photo PEC electrode, which, which has been demonstrated can produce much higher photocurrent density than the uh, flat FTO, uh, 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 fluorine doped tin oxide, TiO2 electrode. And this, this material, uh, photoelectrode, has been shown as a, being a state-of-art uh, uh, state material for this, uh, to drive this water splitting. And this paper has been published in 2013. And we currently, we're also working on using this uh, 
uh, uh, PC devices, for example, use titanium oxide nanowire based PC devices. Also, you um, to drive this um, um, uh, PC, follow uh, the water splitting reactions by uh, using human waste as a as an energy source. Basically, we're trying to use this PC device, devices to generate hydrogen from this uh, human waste. At the meantime, we can disinfect the cells, those pathogen inside of this uh, human waste, so we can gain. Basically, treat, use this waste as a, re, as a valuable resource to gain energy at the meantime to, to reclaim the waters. So we have made some progress here. So the seed fund, which is collaborations within our group and also several other groups uh, on the campus. So what we're trying to do is to understand the, the reaction uh, to basically improve the hydrogen evolution properties of this um, uh, molybdenum sulfide. So we, we, the idea is to support this molybdenum sulfide on the graphene. Graphene is a very good electron conductor, and the molybdenum sulfide has been proved as a good um, catalyst for driving the hydrogen evolution reactions. But there's a problem. Currently, people show the state-of-art performance is lying in these red lines. And the best material of a hydrogen evolution catalyst is platinum, and there's a long way to go. So and the literature and the theoretical study has been shown that the main limitation of this, uh, of this material is limited by the contact between molybdenum sulfide and also this, the age exposure of this molybdenum sulfide. So we're trying to see that how can we improve this age, improve the density of the age of molybdenum sulfide. At the meantime, we improve the contact between molybdenum sulfide material and the underlying graphene. So basically, we're trying to understand and tune the interfacial properties between this uh, two material and two better catalysts. So our strategy is combine the theoretical uh, investigation and the experiment, uh, experiment uh, investigation together and uh, with all this uh, expertise from different groups and trying to establish a uh, correlation between the interfacial mechanical properties and also the charge transport properties with the catalytic, uh, electrochemical catalytic properties together. So that's it.